Aloha, and welcome back to The Creative Life from the American Creativity Association on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Phyllis Bleese, and our co-host today is Darlene Boyd. Our show, we will be discussing the accidental creative. Mm -hmm. You can send questions by email to questions at thinktechhawaii.com. Our guest is Dr. Jane Haran, calling in from her home base in Singapore, where she runs her own company called the Haran Group. She focuses on inclusion and diversity in the workplace with international companies like Disney and Kraft and General Electric, and she also works with private individuals. Jane has lived and worked and studied in the US, China, Japan, India, and Hong Kong. And she holds an educational doctorate from Bristol University. The three books that Jane has written, one is I Wish I'd Known That Earlier in My Career, The Power of Positive Workplace Politics. Another book is How Asian Women Lead, Lessons for Global Corporations. And the third book is Now It's Clear, The Career You Own. Her new book will be coming out in 2022 called The Practice, Coaching Across Cultures. So well, welcome now, Jane. Jane, welcome to The Creative Life, and let me start with you. Uh, first question is, why did you call today's show The Accidental Creative? Uh, yeah, great question. <laughs> um, uh, I think I just kind of well, yeah, actually, I'll tell you, a couple months ago, I took a, you know, a, an assessment and my top uh, strength was creativity. And I told a woman who I didn't know me very well, I said, you know, I get this odd result back. My top score is creativity. And she said, of course, we all knew that. And I went, really? So that's why it hit me to call myself an accidental creative. I've never thought I was creative, but when I look back on my life, I can see weaves uh, periods of creativity or how I, how I go about doing writing or working and all of that. I think more often than not, the people that we think are most creative don't realize that we, they think of themselves differently. And it's, it's no secret that obviously Phyllis and I know you and, and we, the three of us were together in Singapore and I, very early on in first meeting, I thought of you as being very creative. So it's, it's a, it's a welcome opportunity to realize that uh, you're surprised. <laughs> yeah. So so Jane, you you talk about times of creativity, and I notice that the tagline is moments of realization. Could you tell us a little bit about how moments of realization translate into an accidental creative life, and what some of those are for you? Yeah, that term moments of realization came to me, I think in two ways. One, I was writing my dissertation and I, I, I use narrative inquiry. So it's storytelling really. Um, and I was noticing in people's lives where they would have these moments or I had a moment for them when I saw that it, it led to who they are today or it led to, I could see pockets of creativity. And then I also, I think when you're doing your dissertation or when you're writing, you, you really look at yourself, right? And so I started saying, well, I had this, those same patterns, but it's not until you take a step back and look at it that you realize um, either the creativity or the learning in that moment. So, so I, it was the journey of the dissertation, but it was also looking back on my life where I had these pockets where people kept nudging me and I wasn't paying attention to those nudges. Oh, could you talk about a nudge? Well, a big one for me um, was... Uh, so I was at UCI and I was studying social ecology. And I have to tell you, I got so much grief for that major. And that major had a huge impact on my life. Like everybody else was either bio majors or chem majors. And I stuck with it because the first course was fabulous. But I had a professor that came up to me and it was when UCI, I think, at first launched their writing program. And he said, you know, you should join the writing program. I'm thinking, oh, my God, you have no idea. I spend I spend days writing one paper like there's no way I could join that writing group. And years later, when I wrote my first book, I thought, 
I get it. And, and actually I do love the writing process. I find it very creative, but I find it also really daunting. It doesn't come easy. And so that was the first nudge that I didn't pay attention to that I've circled back now and doing it. Oh, and narrative inquiry, what is that? Does that elicit more creativity than any other form of inquiry that you've been using? I'm anxious to hear that too. Yeah. Um, I, so when I went, decided to go back to school to get my doctorate, I was really fascinated by the art of storytelling to uncover insights about people. And I just didn't think you could do it. You know, every, most PhD programs or doctorate programs want you to do, want you to be more quantitative. And I saw this, um, I looked at Bristol University in the UK and it, a narrative inquiry is actually just asking people questions, listening to their stories and then rewriting their stories for them. And so that's where the creativity part comes in. There's an element of narrative inquiry called creative nonfiction, which is what my sponsor encouraged me to use. I, I, I have a secret desire to be Hemingway and she knew that. And so she pushed me to keep writing more, these stories more creatively. I mean, it's, it's the truth in the stories, but it's just the, how you surround it. So that's so where the creative part comes. So it's not an oxymoron to say creative non- fiction uh it 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 sounds like you're infusing life into it not untruth but a, a, a level of life and energy that isn't in your standard flat narrative nonfiction, or a mere embellishment you're not you're not implying that it's an embellishment it's much more as phyllis has just pointed out yeah and it's, it's such a great question because when you talk about creative nonfiction, some supervisors or some professors go wait a minute is this an embellishment is this a real story so it's more wrapping the story around um uh let me just tell you this will be it'll be clear when i tell you i was interviewing a woman for many years for six years and i told her story i used a hemingway voice in telling that story and i i, I interviewed her a lot of times in restaurants so i just I just, I just um, increased the restaurant, the waiters in the restaurant pouring the water and brought her story out that way. But her story was real. It was just surrounding of it. And it puts you right in the place of Singapore in a restaurant. So that's creative nonfiction. So, so and, and just to elaborate a little on that, can you, what is your interpretation of what a Hemingway narrative story is? So we can get a sense of what you mean by a, a Hemingway kind of writer that you'd like to be. What does that evoke for you? <laughs> you know, it's really funny what it evokes for me. Actually, it was my, my sponsor who said, you have a very clip style of writing. Like, so it's a lot of dialogue. And it's uh, when I was a kid, I hated Hemingway. And it wasn't until years later when I started, I joined some Hemingway competitions of imitating him that I really, uh, really loved his writing style. So it's quite clipped. It's very dialogue, um, very simple words. And uh, yeah, I think that's, that's how I would explain it. Um, and I followed one of my favorite short stories, The Well-Lighted Place, to write, to recraft this story uh, for my dissertation. Um. Thank you. Have you ever been to Key West, to Hemingway's home, to see if you could reincarnate Hemingway into your personal delivery? You know, I this one place I've always <laughs> wanted to go is Key West. So it's on my bucket list to get there and to kind of walk in the shoes of Hemingway. Just wondered. <laughs> <laughs> so she, so Darlene, she's only lived in Hong Kong and I know, India and, and China yeah. and Singapore. <laughs> The West is probably dull for you, Jane. <laughs> no, not at all. Not at all. I think it's a fabulous place. I actually think about moving back. So any other moments of realization along your journey? So this is a, you know, what I get to sense is this is a bit of a retrospective to finding those moments, those touch points for creativity in your life. And, and I, one was in that writing class, you just started college You've had the, you've had this aha moment there. What might be another moment of realization along your journey? Yeah, you know, it was interesting. Like when uh, Darlene said earlier, um, I I think that I had wrapped around creativity as art. You know, you have to paint or do something or dance or sing, which is not me. Like I do sketch, whatever. 
so I think a moment of realization. So I always learn through what I don't, what I think I don't like. So another one was um, writing my third book. Um, I felt the need to kind of be really reflective. And I thought that poetry offered a, uh, a way of being reflective, a short poem that you could read and go for a walk. And so I started interviewing poets for that book and I actually started dabbling in poetry myself. And so that was another moment of realization. I think that's a highly creative act and really hard to do. I'm not saying I'm there yet and I wouldn't share any of my poems with anybody, but that was another one. And that was actually very recent. It was like in the writing of this book, I started to kind of try to unpack um, poetry and, and, and poets. Hmm. I have a, I have a, I suppose I could call it a pressing question. Looking at your book titles, uh, they, they're very intriguing and I certainly do want to read them because of the titles, but I do have a curiosity. Your expertise is in diversity training and you've chosen to title one of your books, how Asian women lead. So I'm wondering how, how do they, how do they different? How are they different or are they different or? Help us out with that. Yeah, um, that was um, a title that was the publisher wanted to use that title. My dissertation is called Moments of Realization. And um, so it's a uh, it's an interesting question. So let me let me unpack that a little bit more. I don't, th so when I was doing my dissertation and I focused primarily on Asian women, what I found is there's a culture of gender. So across the globe, we have a lot of similarities um, as women or women in leadership, but specifically in the Asia Pacific region and actually in each country where I went and did my interviews, it there are some differences that I believe, because I do a lot of work with multinationals, that, we, that organizations, Western multi multinationals need to understand this style of leadership might be slightly different. It might not be something that you see all the time. And so from a diverse, from an inclusive perspective, how do you embrace that different style and not, not put a judgment on it? So one would be perhaps maybe a humble servant leader. And I'm not saying everybody in Asia is like this, but sometimes working with um, American firms, they want that court kind of more speak up and, and more bravado. And that not, might not be a style that's preferred in some countries or for some people. So that's some of the slight differences. But I do think it's important to know that what I uncovered and what other researchers uncovered is this gender of culture. And I thought that was so powerful. And I, I saw that. Hmm. I wonder how that translates into learning how to be more inclusive after Black Lives Matter and the Me Too movement. Are we putting ourselves in someone else's shoes and, and valuing that uh, just equally, even if it's different than, than someone else? And, can that, can your training help all of us step into a new day, a new age of inclusivity? Uh, and is that a creative act at the, at the same time? A courageous and a creative act. Yeah, no, I love that step into a new day. Okay, that could be a, my new book. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so let me just circle back to narrative inquiry. Um, when I, I interviewed women from Japan all the way down to Bangladesh, hundreds of women, and then I followed uh, six women for about four to five years and kept interviewing them. I find the process of narrative inquiry, just sitting back and asking open-ended questions, I learned more about them. And actually one woman said to me, you know more about me than I know about me. Mm -hmm. And it's that process of sitting down and listening and listening to someone else's story and then holding back on what we feel, know, or do. Just, just listen. And I actually, I just gave a talk yesterday on this exact same subject and, and uh, wrote another article, published an article on this. So it seems like such a simple thing. And we hear people say, oh, just listen. But it's hard to practice that. And I had to for my dissertation, but I think we need to do this inside organizations. And if we just shifted that, and I love when you said courageous and actually creative and having more empathy, just sit back and listen to someone else's story 
and it'll open your eyes to um, something completely different. I do this all the time with taxi drivers. Like I sit in the, and for some reason, everybody tells me their stories all the time. It can be anywhere, on a plane, in an elevator. Um, it's something about, I think I just listen or say, tell me a little bit more about that. So yes, I would, I'd circle it back to narrative inquiry. And I think we should all do that. So I loved it that you said, they said, you know more about me than I know about myself. And I'm kind of connecting that, the dots to how much meditation and self-help books and, and reflection is going on in the world so we can listen to our own small voice mm. and know what, what our avocation is and learn what's our soul's purpose, you know, what, what, makes us flourish what makes us happy and it seems that that's all different ways of of trying to discover who we are and maybe there's a process of a creative narrative inquiry that we could put ourselves through that doesn't require a second person I mean maybe we could be listening more deeply maybe in in one of your books do you go through a narrative inquiry process or how to so that we can maybe adapt it to self-narrative inquiry? Yeah, um, the third one, Now It's Clear, is exactly that. So oh. the book, Now It's Clear, came from all my research with women. So when I first started re doing this research, I noticed an element of spirituality. So if you read my dissertation, it would talk, I did a whole chapter on spirituality, but actually, as I started digging deeper, it was about purpose. And I love that your term when you use our soul's purpose. And it was this process of looking back on your life and taking, and then getting something that happened and then having a moment of realization across that. You can do it on your own. Absolutely. You can do journaling. That's why I write about journaling. I had took a lot of grief for that third book. People said, oh, don't write about poetry. Well, poetry is incredibly powerful. If you take a poem and read it, you're going to learn a lot about yourself, right? How does that make you feel? What's that? What's coming up for you? Go for walks, get your own journal. So that third book is, is all about that. Uh, it's, it's uh, I should have called it that narrative self-inquiry. <laughs> <laughs> As you said, that could be your next book. Yes. <laughs> or 2.0. <laughs> you know, same book, 2.0. Uh, yeah. Darling, yeah. you were going to say something. How long, Jane, was it before you realized your clarity? Uh, long before it, it was clear to you? And, and, I, and I suppose. Or have you? <laughs> yeah. Or, or have look you? Or is, it, is it ongoing? And when you mention and talk about interviewing these women for six years, uh, another simple question I had was, how did you know it was time to stop? Why six years? Why not seven? Why not eight? Or were you just exhausted? Or, or did your publisher say, this is it, Jane? You know, six years is enough. Let's, let's get some closure. Yeah, let me answer that one first, then I'll answer the second one. I do think it's a, it's still a journey. The first one was actually, it was my dissertation where I interviewed women for six years and I had to have a full stop. And actually I interviewed six women um, and I had to take, my dissertation only required four stories. And so I had to take two women out, which was really painful. Like, which one do you take out? Because you've been interviewing these women for years, right? And you've been so close to them, of course. That would be difficult really close. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I've often wanted to go back and kind of pull out those stories and do a bit more creative nonfiction and write around them, write some stories about them. Um, so it was that, but, but that point when somebody called me and said, you know, me better than myself, I actually cried. Um, it was my idea to send back their story to say, does this make sense? My dissertation didn't require that I could have submitted it without doing that, but I felt an ethical that I felt that I needed to. And I was floored by that. And that's though, when I knew I was onto something with this, this moments of realization, this creative nonfiction, so your first question, I think I am a work in progress. I think we all are. Mm -hmm. um, I, 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 think, I, I think it comes from looking back. And honestly, I have a desire to write. And um, I'd like to write a, a creative, I'd like to write a fiction book. Um, and that's what I'm struggling with now is well, why aren't you writing that? So um so I think we're, I, I think I'm a work in progress. I can't say it for everybody, but I'm still kind of going on that journey of, of figuring out uh, 
I don't know, calling. I enjoy helping other people, which is why I do coaching. And I really enjoy the diversity inclusion work. So I want to ensure that these voices that may not be heard are heard. And so that's sort of a calling for me. But there's another creative side that keeps nudging me. You know, so why, why not fiction? Is it the, is that that calling that you just mentioned that keeps you from moving into fiction? Or you're just, you know, you're just do such a great job. You're comfortable with not moving towards fiction? I think it's a little bit of um, a fear. You know, do I really know how to write a fiction book? I, I have it in my head. I've been writing it for like 15 years now in my head. Um, I know what I want to do with it. I just need to sit down and go, just, just write that. Just put it on paper. You're fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You, you know, you're reminding me as I sit here thinking about the audience and I want to remind people they can send questions in to questions at thinktechhawaii.com. Uh, it, it seems a little out there to think, well, I don't do narrative inquiry to write books about other people. And yet there's, that is an, a doorway to not only creativity, but the creative self as we discuss it today. And I'm reminded that Julia Cameron wrote the book, The Artist's Way. And one of her uh, suggestions is to do morning journaling, even with your left hand. So I just wanted to share that with the audience that uh, that doesn't require any preparation, just requires showing up and starting to write down whatever comes to your mind. There's not anything scientific about this. It's chop wood, carry water, just the discipline. And uh, you're, you're sort of breathing new life uh, it, into the importance of taking that step. And, and journaling is mm. one, one pathway to replicate what you're doing, but doing it by yourself. Absolutely. First of all, she's my favorite. Um, I picked up that book during COVID and did exactly that. So I've had that book on my shelf. I have two copies of that book um, and never really followed it religiously. But during COVID, I did. And I just posted an article about her on LinkedIn. And I can't believe how many people um, that that article, it was a short post, it resonated with them. Everybody recognizes that book. So I, brilliant book. And I actually make comment about her book in my book. I just think she's amazing. Well, well I, think, I think that was a good suggestion to bring, bring her forth. Well, yeah. we're, we're obviously in flow uh, because it, so this is good. It's juicy. It feels good to be pulling this together. And, and I, I, I have a sort of left brain question that I wrote down and we have about seven minutes left. So I want to kind of get this in. I'm, I was noticing that we called this show the accidental creative and then your the moments of realization. And those two things seem to be more looking back at a life, like discovering in a look back at where you were creative. And I was just, they have that quality to them. And I'm wondering about being creative intentionally. And I didn't prepare you for that question, but how do we do that intentionally moving forward using moments of realization that we look back at? at why is, does it always have to be accidental to be creative in your opinion? Or is that, maybe that's okay to stumble into our destiny and discover that we're being creative creative. So that was a jumbled question, but I'm kind of meshing the title and the tagline of today's show with how people can walk away and do this intentionally. That spirit of serendipity, a little bit of serendipity there. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's really interesting. I think that if I was intentionally creative, like if I sat down on my desk and said, okay, I'm just going to be creative. I, I think that would be a block for me. I'm not saying this is for everybody, but I do like your point on, there is an element of looking back, but what I find is when I get stuck is um, if I go for a walk, that's when creativity can be spontaneous for me. So if I'm stuck on a problem, I'm just like, look, I'm just, I'm just going to go for a walk. And I do long walks, a 10 K 12 K 15 K. Um, and it's in that process and not take anything with you. Like don't take the poem, don't take your iPhone, just walk and see what bubbles up for you. And inevitably if I'm stuck on a story, 
that story will become, will come back and I'll be able to write it. So that's, I think that's that spontaneity and that looking forward. It's not looking back. It's just like, get up and do something different. Okay. Well, that, that, you know, in, in the little bit of time remaining, I'm too wondering, is there a question we haven't asked you that would help you bring out something about being accidentally creative or having moments of realization that we haven't asked you something that, I mean, what makes you a corporate rebel? You know, you put that down in your affiliation. That sounds, that sounds juicy. Like we haven't covered that yet today. Yeah, why would a U.S. company hire you as a, a corporate rebel? Why would they want a corporate rebel? Oh, I think the corporate rebel title was the fact that I asked too many questions. So when I was at work, I would ask, why? Well, why are we doing this way? And can't we do it a different way? And that's where that creativity would come in. And people would say to me, can't you just come back down to earth? Like, just, just do it this way. And I'm like, but no, there's so much better ways to do it. So that's why I call myself a corporate rebel, because I question everything. And I try to figure out how we can make it better. Um, and I think that's what it actually makes me a better consultant rather than an employee, because I can go in and speak my mind, not harmful, not hurtful, but just ask the questions like, well, why are you doing it this way? And have you thought about this or how might we do this? And so sometimes, as you know, in corporate, you have to kind of follow this path and people like me, well, I've actually been told stop asking the questions or dial back the creativity. So I would assume the questioning, the techniques that you have just by just in a very natural way uh, work to make you an outstanding coach. Because if, if there's anything, someone, someone that needs a coach certainly wants to be asked the questions to see if they can be better. And if you ask, seems to me you would be asking those in-depth, correct questions. Yeah, thank versus, you for that. Versus how's it going? You know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I suspect you would go deeper. Yeah, thank you for that. I I hope to be a great coach. And I think there's a part with questioning, absolutely. And there's a part with listening. Oh, well, that's a perfect place to leave it with an open invitation for the audience to go pick up your books and wait for your next one. And I want to let everybody know that you've been watching The Creative Life on Think Tech Hawaii. Today, Darlene Boyd and I have been discussing the accidental creative with Dr. Jane Horan. Thanks so much for participating. And Thank thanks you. to our viewers, <laughs> both of you. Thanks to our viewers. I'm Phyllis Bleas, and we'll be back in two weeks with another edition of The Creative Life. Aloha, everyone.